the love, peace, hope and grace of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all. A very warm welcome to this time of worship. Wherever you are joining us from, north, south, east or west, you are very welcome. Throughout October we are taking part in the national giving season. The season provides time for people of all ages an opportunity to reflect on God's presence with us through these challenging times and to offer gifts of thanksgiving back to God. 50% of donations will be going to the Duffus Spine and Hopeman Church, 25% to Hopeman Community Minibus and 25% to Murray Firth Radio Cash for Kids Appeal for all the monies that are raised within the Duffus Spine and Hopeman Parish. Information of how to give by bank transfer and cheque can be found in the National Giving Day information which was part of the church magazine. It's also available online on the Duffus Spiny and Hopeman website or you can pick up a paper copy of the magazine with the National Giving Day insert in any of our church buildings. In our in-person services on the 10th, 17th and 24th of October, we hope to be able to share some fellowship with some refreshments of tea and coffee after a time of worship. We may be able to take some time to reflect in our church buildings in each of them in turn at the different services and take an opportunity to give and have some thanksgiving for God's presence with us. The refreshments will be served with suitable COVID safety precautions taken. The in-person service on the 10th of October will be in Spiney Kirk and in, on the 17th in Hopeman Kirk, both at 10.30am. This coming Sunday on the 3rd of October at Duffus Kirk, we join together to celebrate Thanksgiving for Harvest. We also celebrate a baptism celebrate communion and start to think about our October national giving season. If you are able and feel comfortable to attend in person, you would be made to feel very welcome. At our in-person service in Duffus, we hope to have a live stream service available also for those who are not able to be with us in person but wish to view the service in live time. For this time of worship as we celebrate and think about our harvest and keep in mind the theme from September of our response and actions for climate change. I am delighted later in the service to share with you a reflection by Bob Kikuyu, Global Theology Advisor for Christian Aid. First, let us settle ourselves for this time of worship with Psalm 67. God, be merciful to us and bless us. Look on us with kindness, so that the whole world may know your will, so that all nations may know your salvation. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, because you judge the peoples with justice and guide every nation on earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. The land has produced its harvest. God, our God, has blessed us. God has blessed us. May all people everywhere honour him. Let us hear now from the word of God, reading from John 6, verses one 13. Jesus feeds 5,000. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing the sick. Jesus went up a hill and sat down with his disciples. The time for the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked around and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, so he asked Philip, Where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He had said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Philip answered, For everyone to even have a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. 
Another one of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. There was a lot of grass nearby. So all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and they all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces left over, let us not waste a bit. So they gathered them all, and filled twelve baskets with the pieces left over from the five barley loaves which the people had eaten. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, I'm glad to be a part of you this morning speaking from Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I was born and raised in this very, very city. And therefore, every visit to our farm and my relatives was always fascinating. And the one that still stands in my memory is related very much to Sunday worship, which I'm sure many of you are a part of on a regular basis. And I was taken aback the first time that I saw during that Sunday worship service in a church up country, somebody bring cobs of maize. I'm not sure if you refer to it as corn over here, but I was fascinated when I saw somebody bring cobs of maize to the front of the church as their offering. And another person followed thereafter with eggs. This was a surprise because even at that very tender age, I knew that the offering that one brought to church was monetary. And I was even more fascinated to realize that um, later on in another visit, immersion baptism was being conducted in a river and not the baptistry, something that I have continued to see even till today in a church that is not too far away from where I live. Those became powerful, very, very powerful images for me. And they made such a connection for me between God and creation. It could easily therefore be hypothetical, but it is not. And allow me here to just say that I speak from a very global South perspective in many of the examples that I do, because these are from, in a sense, lived experiences. What, what do the worshippers do when the river runs dry and they use it for immersion baptism? The natural thing you think is to organize for water to be brought to the baptistry for the ceremony in that rural church. Yet for many of those rural communities in the global south, like the Maasai, where my wife hails from, and a community that I visit on a very regular basis. The concept of a baptistry is foreign to them. And the only thing that is used for storing water is possibly a trough for the calves that cannot be taken to the river and therefore water is transported from the river and deposited there so that they could drink for it. And that, by the way, is if there is water to collect. So the straightforward answer is that when the river dried up two years ago, no immersion baptism took place for the faith community in that area. But suppose you were to import the water and put it in a container and did not give priority to the cattle who are always given priority when water is supplied. There would have been an immediate disconnect for the faith community with the rest of the church, with the rest of the community who would not have understood why the faith community was putting people in water instead of serving it to the community lifeline, which is the cows. For the cows provide the milk that sustains the community. The church then would have lost its witness in that particular area and it would have failed in its sense of mission amongst those Maasai people. And it happened, it happened that there was no water because there was no rain and the rivers had no water running in them. 
And therefore, with no river due to the drought, there was no baptism. And sadly, in that very, very same period in 2019, when the drought ended, there was heavy rain that followed thereafter for many months, which took away people's lives. The roads were spoiled, the bridge across the river was washed away, and many people from across the river could not attend church services. The reality is that for many people in the global south, the expression of worship is connected to nature itself. Of course, with modernity, some cultures have changed and adopted to modern living, but there are still many places where the offering that is brought on a Sunday by individuals is a produce from the farm. Over this month, I have been speaking at the Sunday services in the church that I served as a senior minister before moving into a development position in an organization that I started. On the second Sunday of this month of September, someone brought a sack of grains as their offering. And I noted how the following Sunday, or the Sunday thereafter, the service leader announced how timely the offering of grain was because it met the urgent needs of some people in the community who did not have faith. It is right to give what you have in your hands. And in many places, what people have in their hands is what they have received from their collaboration with nature in working or tilling the land. And when that collaboration is disrupted, it does have an effect, not just on livelihoods, but on worship as well. The climate crisis is an existential threat that needs to be viewed with consequences beyond the physical, but also extending to the psychological and the spiritual. For our cultures in the global south, nature is understood in the way it is spoken of in scripture as reflected in Psalms 19, where it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Nature speaks. And when it speaks, we listen. When we listen, we respond in worship because it is God who has spoken. Therefore, when the drought fell on us in Kenya in the time that I referred to earlier, the president led the country during a national day of prayer in repentance because he understood and we understood and the faith community understood and by extension, the nation understood that is how God speaks. When the rains fail, we somehow understand it is because the Lord has withheld the rains because of something we may have done. And when the floods came shortly after the drought, there was great celebration that the Lord had heard our prayers, but our dancing turned to wailing when floods began taking people's lives and the question was raised again, Lord, why have you visited your fury upon us? There was confusion for these two extremes. For many people, the first thought was not a climate crisis, but about our relationship with God. However, the connection is slowly being made that the effects we are feeling when nature hits back are indeed because of something human beings have done. We have not cared for creation. The government is suddenly talking about it but most people still do not understand or connect it, connect with it, partly because the people who are suffering the most are the people who are contributing the least to the climate crisis. 
And if we could point to what the indigenous Maasai are doing to cause the climate crisis, it would have been easier to make the connection. Yet, when they are doing their utmost to live in harmony with nature, as they have been doing for centuries, there are some a distance away who are consumed with the unquenchable thirst for more that is causing all of creation to hit back and hold back. The statistics say the global north is objectively producing more carbon emissions and plastic waste than the global south. In terms of excess global carbon emissions, the United States is responsible for 40% of it and the EU for 29% of it. In total, the global north is responsible for 92% of emissions, China probably contributing a significant part of the other. And in terms of waste, well, the United States, Denmark, and New Zealand generate at least twice as much waste per capita than developing countries. So certainly our government in the global south can do more to combat the climate crisis. We can do more to reduce the destruction of our forests, whether for fuel or leasing it to multinationals for the, for the development of large farming, farming estates. But the reality is the contribution of people in these areas in the global south is small. The people in the industrialized nations need to do a lot more. And we ask the question, will the COP26 really understand that there are multifaceted dimensions to this crisis? The church can play its part in challenging governments to do more so that creation can speak the way it was intended for it to speak on behalf of a creator loving God. Our global voice and constituency can amplify the voice of those most affected, but can also speak into the future we shall leave for our children. The way things are, we seem to have distanced ourselves from creation in our worship, and therefore have also distanced ourselves from the responsibility, not just to care for creation, but to journey with creation. And when creation groans in agony, looking forward to its liberation, we are deaf to its cry. We have, in a sense, left it to the climate experts and environmentalists or the government to be responsible for sorting out those issues. We need a new relationship with creation. Creation has suffered immensely under us and it certainly could do very well without us at this rate. But we have been created as part of creation and cannot stand apart from that story of creation in Genesis, even though we do act that way nowadays. We have acted very much in a prodigal way, having taken our inheritance and squandered it. The bigger misfortune may be that we are squandering not just our inheritance, but that for the generations after us. The prodigal must return to the relationship that God intended for us and creation. And it needs to be not just one of stewardship, for as I have said, we have not acted well in that capacity, but it needs to be one of solidarity with creation. In the return of the prodigal, we should see ourselves not just above creation, where we use and abuse it for our own ends and means. We need to see ourselves as part of creation so that when it suffers, we suffer as well. The reality is that it is increasingly visible as well as felt most recently with the temperatures in the north reaching historic highs. Seeing ourselves as one with creation can happen when we as the prodigals return to what God intended in our relationship with creation. And that can certainly be aided greatly by bringing, bringing creation into our worship and showing that we are in a journey of solidarity together awaiting that liberation. I look forward to our liturgy expressing that relationship I look forward to the symbols that we use in worship, reflecting that solidarity. 
And I look forward to our singing and our prayers showing that we are one with creation. Ahead of us lies a great opportunity for transformation. And it is in a new relationship with creation. May the Lord help us and strengthen us in this journey. Amen. Let us raise our prayers to God together. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we raise to you our prayers of thanksgiving for the wonderful harvest we can too often take for granted. We thank you for all the food, water and many other resources we enjoy every day. We thank you for all those who work hard in the process to make sure people are fed, including farmers, farm workers, those who work in the fishing industry, packers, delivery drivers, market stall staff and shop workers and many others who work unseen. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder of how climate change can affect the lives of those working on farms around the world and in many other industries, how floods or scorching heat can damage crops, how many must prioritise the distribution of water between cattle or crops and people. Our God, we raise to you all who find their means of worship affected by the effects of climate change. In this country, we may not think twice about using water and other resources in our worship, but for others in different countries, resources can be scarce. Bless their efforts, Lord, and we thank you for their faithfulness and for the reminder that everyone matters in the fight for climate justice. Help us to do our best to change our attitudes and to encourage others to change attitudes, to act for fair trade and climate justice and fairness. Hear us now, Lord, as we raise to you the words Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We join together to sing the hymn from CH4. 685 for everyone born a place at the table.
now into the coming week in peace, secure in the knowledge of God's unfailing love, reminded of climate justice and the impact climate change is having around the world, and the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be with us all and all whom we love, this day and always. Amen.